Hi. Um, I'm Brenda McLaren. I've been uh, working on in the storage stack for oh, probably longer than I want to admit. Um, but I just joined Red Hat not not quite a year ago, so I have a year coming up in September. Um, great opportunity to learn Ceph. Um and then the integration with OpenStack and, and OpenShift. So what I wanted to do was um, kind of cover deploying Ceph externally and then integrating with um, OpenStack and OpenShift and what was required. Um, so I'll go over a uh, Ceph installation of all the different components and the networks that um, that Ceph uses, um, some information about the pools, the data protection, and then security. Um, and then we'll cover the open, once we get that installed, then we'll, um, I'll kind of show you the integration with um, OpenStack and then um, the OpenShift integration as well. If we have time, which I doubt we'll have, uh, I was also going to show you the, the ODF uh, installation um, as well. So the three core components to set is the like starting with the OSDs, the um, object storage demons. That's what is actually writing the data to the disk, right? So it's a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship, um, primarily with the set OSDs to the actual disks that are in the storage nodes. Um, there are times when uh, you can use like a bigger OSD. Let's say like if you have an NVMe and you have eight terabytes, you may partition that and go with two four terabytes and then have two OSDs to that one. But for the most part, most of the uh, in installations are one OSD daemon to um, a disk. And that daemon, obviously, all of this runs in containers. So whatever we say, like the service or the daemon, we're, we're talking about containers. Um, the stuff mon or the monitor is what actually retains the, uh, what we call the crush map. The crush map is, if I can remember this off the top of my head, um, control replication under scalable hashing. So it has, it retains the mapping so that any whatever the client wants to talk to Seth, the client doesn't have to go look up any information. It's just going to be able to go and like determine exactly which OSD it needs to talk to, and to be able to pull that data from uh, from the object store. So there, the monitors. There's a minimum of three. That's why Seth always requires a minimum of three nodes because you can't deploy two monitor containers on the same node. They have to be on three separate nodes. So that's the minimum uh, cluster size. And then you have the Ceph Manager, which um, kind of runs alongside of the Ceph Monitor. Um, it collects the state information, and it also uh, supplies the um, APIs to be able to pull information from the Ceph cluster. Uh, two additional services are the RGW service, which is uh, for the Radios Gateway. That's the interface to be able to use S3 or Swift. And then also we have the MDS metadata service, which is going to be the service that takes care of um, all of the file system data, whenever you're using file uh, services from the SEP cluster. Both the RDW and the MDS are generally deployed after um, RDW can deploy when you deploy the SEP cluster, but the MDS has to be deployed after the SEP cluster is already up and running. Um, you can deploy multiple RGW um, uh, gateways. Most of the demons, you can only deploy one containers or one container service per um, server, but with RGW, you can deploy multiple RGW gateways on the same on the same node. But MDS, you have to deploy um, a minute. You you really should deploy a minimum of of two. It uses one active, one standby. There is a way that you can configure um, active active MDS servers um, now with the newer releases of SEP. Um, so we have all these different services, and when you go to deploy, you can um, use what we call um, co-location, which is running multiple demons on the same um, SEP cluster, or on the, on the same SEP nodes. Um, and the OSDs, which is going to give you a lower TCO, right? So that you don't have to have 
like one server for MDS, one server for RTW, another one for the different monitors, you can kind of co-locate these demons. So in this example, we have um, three nodes and we can deploy an OMD on each of those nodes, each one of the um, the monitors to give um, to give the minimum of three. And then you can have Grafana deployed on, on the first node. You can have RGW or CephFS. You don't want to deploy those demons um, on the same nodes. Um, so in this, this is a minimal configuration. You're not going to have high, you're not going to have like HA for your for your RGW or CephFS if you're trying to deploy both of those. Um, then you can get into uh, like a four node configuration. Um, again, you know, just like spreading these out in this particular case, you know, RGW is a little more highly available or MDS, you know, for CFFS is just on one node. Um, this is kind of like something that interesting uh, that Darren and I were talking about is that, you know, kind of my note on the side is the minimum storage cluster is three nodes. Um, but if you have a replica of three, and we're going to get into replica in a minute, you really should have um, a minimum of four nodes. So it's always whatever your replica is, you should have that plus one more node. Um, I know that in some of the, like the director deployed stuff or the HCI environments for OpenStack, they have like a minimum of three nodes, but in the Ceph documentation, it says that if you're gonna have a replica of three, you really, that, that Red Hat recommends four nodes. And the reason for that is that if you lose a node, um, that and it's going to be down for any length of time. It need, it's going to have to rebalance that data, and you're only going to have two nodes, so you're really like at risk, right? Um, going on to the network piece of it, stuff uses um, two to it can use one, but it, we recommend two. We recommend one for the front end. Yes. Sorry, right, back to so what you're saying if you if you select three nodes. Uh, cluster, it's probably a better idea to put two extra applications. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and it says that, you know, like if you have, if you, if you're using a replicate of two, then yeah, you can have three nodes and that's, that's not an issue. But if you have a replica of three, you really should have four nodes. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so with the, with the public network, um, that's going to be the client, um, Traffic. So any request that come in comes into the Ceph cluster is going to come across the public network or the you know, client facing network. But then Ceph likes to have a back end network to be able to separate that replication data, the rebalancing data, the heartbeat data um, off onto a separate network. Um, one thing to point out, like especially with like for the for this purpose is that whenever a client writes to an OSD, and let's say that you have the replica of three, it's gonna write that data to the first OSD, and then the, that OSD is gonna be responsible for replicating that data to the other two OSDs in the cluster. And that's gonna happen on the backend network. When the backend network is saturated, it will overflow to the front end network. Any questions on the network? Yes, I've heard many names for these networks. Sometimes it's public network, and sometimes it's uh, 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 the private network. As yeah, private, yeah, private yep. cluster. Um, they use private, like really private and cluster network. They use those interchangeable, but it's that's the back end network for that for that replication and backfilling and mm -hmm. and step service. You know, like like cluster traffic. Was that your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so when we talk about um, durability, right? Because we we have to expect the hardware to fail, right? It's not an exception to the rule. It's it's the rule. It's going to fail. So the replica, the default in Ceph is three um, replicas. So it uses a lot of storage, right? It's it's using reacts the amount of data that you're writing. Um, you can use erasure coded pools and they're, they've kind of expanded like over the last um, iteration, I think like in five, 
and and then in six, there's like additional pools that you can now use erasure coding on. And so it puts that, it, it puts like some CPU um, overhead on whenever you use the erasure coding. But again, it's that it's that SEP OSD that is taking care of that erasure coding. And so um, for those of you that might not be familiar with erasure coding, is you can think of it as um, like software based RAID, right? It's taking that data, it's chunking it up, and then it's applying um, a, a parity against that data, and then writing, you know, like spreading that data out across. Uh, you know, whatever the erasure coding scheme is. And I want to say there's, I think there's three off the top of my head that you can use. Um, it's like eight, eight plus, eight plus four, eight plus three, and four plus two. So the minimum is going to be like, it's going to split that date, that's going to split that object into four parts and then apply two, um, two, two sets of parity and then spread that out over six devices. So that actually, reduces the amount of storage that you have to use. So a lot of times um, if, when people deploy staff and they're using RGW for objects, they'll use they'll use uh, erasure coding for those object pools. But for the index pool, it's required that you use replication. And that's because like for that index pool or the metadata pool, that because those lookups have to be so quick, they want the data just replicated as opposed to erasure coded. Um, but you can use erasure coded pools for the um, the RBD pools and um, for the um, the CFFS uh, data pools. But again, not the index pool. Um, and if I'm throwing out too many acronyms, let me know because like I'm now I'm I like I know it's hard to keep up with them. I always I always am challenged by that. But RBD is is the um, the Rados block devices. And so that's the that's the block service that you're getting as a default with um, with Seth. And whereas like RGW is the S3 service, and then um, CephFS is the file. And can you can you mix and match kind of like can you put uh, erasure coding for RGW on the same cluster, and then three X or two X replication on, a, on another pool? You you can. Um, the nice thing about Seth is it is it separates everything into pools. So you can, whenever you create the pool, you're going to set up what the data durability on that pool is. So if you create, and you can create an, R, um, an RBD pool, and like if you just created the default one, it would be replicated. But let's say that you want to have an RBD pool, RBD pool that doesn't need the performance, and like that your normal RBD pool would, but you can create that as erasure coded. And then you can create um, you can create an RGW pool that is um, replicated, and you can create another one that is erasure coded. And in in a spe like um, actually specifically with RGW, um, if you're familiar with S3 and some of the different capabilities, um, like you can you you can do multi part uploads. The multi part upload that bucket or that pool. That is that is used for that has to be replicated, and it's because it can't have that overhead of having to take that ingest that data, and in the to the multiple parts, and then put it all together, and then shoot it back out to um to the the erasure code is what it would do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um. So for authentication, um. Uh, Seth uses uh, what they call Seth X, um, which it's it's. I want to say I'm not real, real, real like in depth knowledgeable on Kerberos, but they say that it's similar to Kerberos, um, and that you don't get tickets, but you get tokens. Um, but the way that the Seth X authentication works is that Seth holds a key. Kind of, I think it's more similar to like AWS um, S3. Where it holds it holds your secret key, and you know your secret key, but the two are never exchanged in the conversation between you and and your authentication with Seth, because you're going to give Seth some some information, and it's going to be like you're going to give it like your user ID, the pool, and uh, the object name, and you're going to hash that with your key, 
And then, and then that goes to Seth, and then Seth can decrypt that because it has your key as well. And so that how you, that's you know basically how it's working to do that authentication without having to transmit that secret key. Um, whenever users are created, the authorization is um, is granted whenever you create that user, and so. Um, all users uh, with SAP have to have read access to the monitors to be able to get that crush map, right? So that they always know where, uh, where all the, what, what we call the placement groups for the pools. It has to be able to get that information so it knows which, um, which pool and which OSD to talk to. So you get read access to the monitor and then you would get, um, Read or read and or write access to the specific pools that you need to be able to access, whether that's an RBD pool, a FFS pool, or or RGW. And then the RBW, like the S3 and the SWIFT, that is like a different set of authentication that is handled through the RGW gateway. How am I doing on time? You're good. Um, okay, so now we're getting into the we're getting into this up installation. Um, but one thing that like is really stressed um, when we're working with uh, with different customers is really make sure that you know your workloads um, and what you're expecting out of Ceph before you actually go to do to the deployment, right? Because I mean, the nice thing about Ceph is that it, it that it does separate everything into into the different pools. But you also want to make sure that you use the right disks, right? You, you don't have to have all NVMe or all SSD drives, right? You can have some of the data sitting on spinning disks, especially with your um, with your object store, right? It's always better to put your object data on spinning disk and use your RVDs um, and some of your CephFS, you know, like on your um, on your higher um, on your you know, like your faster disk. Um, so, so really whenever it comes to, and, and I, <laughs> I had, um, the opportunity to actually like learn how to deploy SAP with one of my coworkers for a POC that we did. And it just seemed like, like whenever OpenStack goes to deploy, it's just like so long and just like so labor intensive, it seems like. Um, and to me, this is like, is really simple to be able to deploy this as an external cluster. Um, so it requires the Ceph ADM Ansible um, package that you have to install on the on the on actually the first node in the cluster or whatever your administrative node is going to be. Um, and then once you have that package installed, you create uh, your host file, and then you're going to run your pre-flight um, playbook, and then that's going to go out and it's going to put like some required packages on um, each of the the nodes that you're that's going to. Uh, create your cluster. And then my uh, way, the way that I did it um, is I always create a root staff directory. Um, and then in that root staff directory, I have like my initial config, I have um, my registry login information so that you, you can pass that registry information on the command line, or you can just um, use a, a JSON file and that way you don't have to pass the password on the command line. Um, and then once you do that, you create a, an initial cluster configuration file, and then you can bootstrap the cluster. So with that, um, I'm going to get out of here and go to, yep, we're going to go right here. So um, this, I already have the sub, um, sub ADM Ansible package already installed. So if we just go to... Um, And we look, we have, um, I have that the host file already created. So I have four nodes in my cluster and the administrative node is going to be the Ceph01 node. Can you guys, can anybody see that okay? Or do we need to, I can make it a little bit bigger, I think. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me see here. Oops. That's not the right window I was looking for. Okay, yep. so here I just have everything so I can just copy and paste because you do not want to see me have to type all that. 
So here we're going to go ahead and just um, just create uh, or run the, the prefix playbook. And uh, you have to pass it that extra bars and you have to say where the sub origin is. So in this particular case, I'm saying that it's custom because we're using our repository in our lab as opposed to going out to like to the Red Hat repository. And this, this isn't going to take really too long because it, it's going to skip some of the stuff because like I've already installed it and then kind of blew it away and installed it again. Um, so that part's done. So you can see that didn't take very long. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to go, oops, we're going to go over to uh, root stuff. And here I have some of the files already done. So like I'm going to show you this registry login file and it, it's you know, like something quick and dirty here that you're just saying what registry you're going to use. You're going to have to pass it your username and then whatever your password is. So you want to make sure that you put the right permissions on this file, obviously. Um, so because I'm actually using um, my information, I'm going to copy my, uh, my, oops. Uh, We can overwrite that. And then, okay, so then I wanted to show you the, um, so this is the initial configuration file. So you're going to um, put your four different, like in this case, the four different hosts you're going to have in the cluster. And then there's this, um, this service right here for the monitor. I'm going to tell if the placement is going to be on Seth nodes one, two, and three. Um, it only needs to be on three of the nodes. It's a minimum requirement. Yeah, um, it's always best to use like three, five, seven, etc. Um, and then here is is my information for the OSD. So I'm saying to go ahead and put the OSDs. I know it's one through four, and then to also use um, the device uh, slash dev slash VDB. Yeah. On the uh, placement there, if it's going to be all the nodes, can you just leave that out and it'll do all the nodes? You can't leave it out, but you can you can see that it's actually like a, I don't know, like what do you, like a regular regular expression. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could have said I could have just said like step faster. Oh uh, yeah, I just you know if you left it out, it would do all. No, you have to actually stay with the placement. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And so here is going to be the command, and whenever I pop it in here, you'll be able to see it a little bit better. So this is going to be what's going to um, actually do the installation. So we're going to give it, um, we're going to give it the monitor IP address. So that's the, that's just one of the monitors that. Um, one of the nodes that it has the like the monitor on it, right? So I said step one was going to be a monitor node. So I just took that IP address. And then the apply spec is this initial configuration. You can pass it what the initial dashboard password is going to be. There's another option that you can say uh, dash dash no password update, which means that you can set what the initial dashboard password is going to be, and then you won't have to change it if you pass that additional parameter. But in this case, because I'm using change me, of course, I would want to, um, I would want to pass that, or I would want to change that upon my initial login. And then the registry.json is that file that has my login information. And then I'm also going to say to use a separate cluster network. So while this is going off and doing its thing, it should finish up by the time that um, we finish the presentation here. Um, but I'm going to go back into presentation mode. Um, so all this information is here. And then also in the slide deck, which if anybody wants it, um, it, in the appendix, I have a lot of the different, like the example files that I've used in this presentation um, as well. So to, we talked a little bit about the pools. Um, when we... Um, why don't we get the cluster up and running? I'll actually just I'm gonna run something real quick that's gonna go out and create the pools, but um, there's not going to be any pools defined except there's one um, that Seth creates for its own use. 
but then we need to create some RBD pools, the RGW pools, and the Seth pools. Um, it's recommended to pre-create the RGW pools because we want to use a lower number of what we call placement groups um, than usually what the default is. And then if you um, if you want to create um, the pool or the RGW service going across multiple different zones, you need to be able to create those uh, those pools with those zone names in them. Um, and then again, we talked about the erasure coded pool for uh, multi or for the data bucket and the non uh, erasure coded pools for multi part uploads. And then for SFS, you those pools have to be created uh, when you deploy the service. So there's a couple of different ways you can do it. But anyway, I'm going to show you creating the pools and then deploying the service. Um, so the OpenStack integration, um, you know, the, the latest is 17.1, you know, like sweet, you know, Red Hat's having our hat fest for it, and we're deploying um, SEF6. Um, so when you're doing external, like if uh, we're talking about creating the pools, and so for the four services, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to be over time here a little bit, um, you know, for Cinder Nova Glance and, and the Cinder Backups, there's default names that are used. And so if you create these pools as these names, you don't have to use any overrides in the um, OpenStack deployment, but you can name them anything you want. And then in the in, in your environment files, you can actually um, set what those are. Um, and then on the subcluster, we want to create a client OpenStack user. And then if you're going to use the Manila services for CephFS, you create that user as well. Um, on the OpenStack side, um, there's these environment file uh, environment files here, and then you can create the custom environment file to override these. So again, it's kind of like going back to here to say like what these these pool names are and what the what the user is if you don't use the default. Um, and then once that's done, then all you have to do is the, um, the OpenStack overcloud deploy, and it's going to go and or like with 17, you have to do the deploy set step and then it's going to take this information and then it's going to go talk to that external cluster and do whatever it needs to do on the OpenStack side to be able to set up that communication and set up the sender um, service and Manila and whatever else that you're going to deploy in this. Um, whenever it comes to the OpenShift integration, um, you want to make sure that like you install the OpenShift Data Foundation operator, and then there's just a few prerequisites that you want to make sure um, is configured on the Ceph side, and that is that the Ceph dashboard is configured because that is going to integrate some of that into the OpenShift dashboard, and that the PG Autoscaler is enabled, and um, that the RBD pools exist. Um, and again, it's recommended that when you create your pools, and you're, in, you're using SAP for, let's say, an OpenStack cluster and another OpenShift cluster and maybe a third cluster that's OpenShift, is that all the pools are, are dedicated to those particular clusters. Um, so once you, if you just install the ODF operator, um, it, which is going to be different as you don't install the LSO, uh, the local storage operator, you just install ODF, and then you go to create the storage system. And when you create the storage subsystem or the storage cluster, um, there's going to be a script that you download from ODF or for actually from OpenShift. And then you take that Python script and you either like go over to the Ceph cluster yourself or you give it to your storage admin and they run that script and it's just going to go out and collect data from, um, from that set cluster and it's going to create the user that it needs to be able to communicate um, to with the pools and gives the right um, the right permissions. And then you're going to get an output, you're just going to get a JSON file of um, information and then that's going to be uploaded into the um, into the GUI and then you click next and it goes out and it does its magic and it deploys the, um, the cluster and sets up all the services. So it's going to set up your REs and it's going to set up your uh, your gateways. It'll it'll still install Nuba for the multi cloud gateway, um, and you're off to the races. So with that, let's see um, how we did. So we actually have a, a cluster up and running, and that's how long it took to install the cluster.
So I'm over a little bit. Um, so I'll take any questions, but I'll, like, I'll be more than happy to, like afterwards, maybe to show you the ODF um, if anybody's interested. But any questions? For the performance impacts for a, a virtual machine, for instance, running on erasure coding versus replication. So for, for like for block for RVD yeah. um for something like that that we, we only support is um they only support um replica. Gotcha. So I mean, you would you would have you would have a performance impact. Yeah. I think it doesn't support do you know roughly what's the difference in performance like for VF? No. I don't. I isn't that no. I, I wouldn't even venture to guess. And a lot of times whenever like Anytime there's questions that come up on performance, they, I mean, they always say your performance will vary and you test it out. <laughs> like, and, like, and like, I get that even like coming from the cus customer side, you can always ask that question. Every vendor is always going to tell you your performance may vary. So it's always best to test it out. Is there any performance improvements on in step six versus step five? Um, you know what? That's a great question. And I do know that they did make a lot of performance um, enhancements. And um, that one document that we have to fill out, um, for, you know what, which one I'm talking about? Sure. Um, I got a really good article from uh, Kyle Bader. Uh, and it, it, it talks about what improvements they made in SAP 6, especially for large scale deployment um because of like some testing that they did with like thousands of OSPs and like when they go through upgrades of, of like how things are impacted on really large scale clusters. Any other questions?